What can an English professor with expertise in Victorian literature teach us about the coronavirus? Well, germ theory became popularized during that era. So this is when people realized that we were the vectors of our own illnesses. Now, one would think that this would cause us to isolate ourselves from one another, like we're doing now. But the literature at the time, which reflects the thinking of the time, shows us that it actually brought us closer together. So a message of hope in these dire times. Dr. Kari Nixon is an assistant professor of English at Wentworth University. And she teaches medical humanities, Victorian literature, and is forever interested in death, disease, risk, and why we fear them. Dr. Nixon's work has been shared on the Huffington Post, March for Science, and more. Her first book, Kept from All Contagion, Germ Theory, Disease, and the Dilemma of Human Contact will be in print in spring 2020. She got her PhD at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, with a dissertation in Victorian bioethics, which she turned into the aforementioned book. She teaches both Victorian literature and contemporary medical humanities and can be found at mknixon.com. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Professor Kari Nixon, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I've been really looking forward to it. So how is it that you wrote a book about epidemics that's set to come out in April of 2020? And and it was the topic of your dissertation. So this was done years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's being released in the midst of the worst pandemic the world has seen in 100 years. So (laughs) where is your time machine? What stocks have you been buying now that everything's down? <laughs> so clearly, I can't ask you about sports betting since the NBA and the NHL have been canceled. So right, how, right. Do you, how does that happen? Uh, you know, the funny thing is that I think, I mean, I guess there's not too many of us uh, disease scholars, but I, I would venture to bet, and apparently I'm good at betting, you would say, I would venture to bet that most disease scholars would just simply say that disease is always relevant, unless that seem uh, just any professor who is, of course, going to say that their esoteric specialty in research is always relevant, which I think is a sort of professorial thing to say. For me, the idea, I mean, of course, it is oddly coincidental that my book is coming out in the middle of this pandemic. But for me, the reason I wrote the book and the reason I'm fascinated with what society does in the face of disease is because it's always just a matter of time. It is an inevitability. And that's sort of a crux of my book. On an individual level, I argue that disease is an inevitability. We will all get sick. People say death and taxes, but I say death, taxes, and disease are the three things you can depend on in life. And so if you think about any other a catastrophe, I don't know, war maybe, I can visualize a way in which we could theoretically avoid war because we're talking about diplomacy and people maybe negotiating. We don't get to negotiate with disease, which are diseases and disease outbreaks, which are essentially one form of, I guess, a natural disaster. So for me... It's not that surprising that it happens to come out in this really relevant time because have you seen that meme? It it goes around a lot of Kermit sipping tea. Uh, What is he saying while he's sipping tea? And what kind of tea is it? Uh, I think it's Lipton tea. Lipton tea, okay. He's always, it's usually captioned with, but that's none of my business. But he has this kind of look on his face like he could have told you this was going to happen. And I just keep visualizing myself that way lately. (laughs) Like... The coincidence doesn't seem coincidental to me because I feel like the very nature of my book has been kind of screaming into a void that disease is coming for all of us and we ought to think about that when we're not in that moment of crisis to understand what we will feel like in the moment of crisis and do better at that point. So, yeah. So if if you can use that time machine again... (laughs) <laughs> right, your your book is arranged by disease. Each disease you cover gets a chapter. Right. 
So you've now written a coronavirus chapter. <laughs> what are some of the highlights? Or are there no, is there no coronavirus chapter since people are now mostly buying into the germ theory? I'm sure there are some French people mm. out there, but really it's not, I guess it's not germ theory anymore. So, so is that even a chapter? Right. It's not really a theory anymore, is it? It's just germs. <laughs> you know, I actually think there's a really great parallel between the things I cover in my book, the diseases I cover, and the emerging coronavirus disease right now. The reason I cover the specific diseases I do and the time period I do is because in the 1880s to the 18, 1895, 97, this 15-year period is this really interesting slice of history in which most people are buying into germ theory at that time, although they are still calling it germ theory. Most people pretty much believe it. They've started using Robert Cook's theories to identify certain bacteria under a microscope. And I'm sure anybody who's done laboratory science in undergrad or postgrad is familiar with Cook's postulates of how we culture a bacteria in a Petri dish and then correlate it with the causal pathogen that we see creating clinical manifestations in a patient. So people were believing in bacteria at this time as disease causing vectors, but they had, they couldn't do anything about it. Anything. We don't even have penicillin until 1928. So there's this really interesting time period in this little 15 year segment that I study in which there's sort of just this existential horror. And I know that sounds sort of like an unscientific term, but I, I just love when the sort of cerebral realm of science and history meets up with what are the undeniably human components of our existence, such as fear and hope and a, a desire to live. So there's this existential horror that I notice in this time period where they suddenly see and identify everything that's killing them and they have zero tools against it, except maybe they had started to understand antiseptics at that time, they had a few. They did understand that hand washing and sanitation helped. And isn't that exactly where we find ourselves today at 6, 15 p.m. Pacific Central Time on March 16th, 2020? When we have a disease that is an emerging infectious disease, an EID, that we don't fully understand, we are back in the Victorian's footsteps where we see something and we definitely see the epidemiological data that proves that it is killing people. And all we really know to do is our basic sanitation practices. It's just, it's so for me, it is exactly that human and societal reaction that I wanted to isolate culture, if you will, to use Cook's words and Petrie's words in this book that I'm seeing again here with this infection. It's like you've got all the same ingredients, the same media in that Petri dish. I'm going to stick with that metaphor until it gets real old. <laughs> and, and what I'm seeing are the same social reactions on all ends of the spectrum that I identified in my book happening to the Victorians. What do you mean? What are some examples? Well, the thing that I talk about in my book and, and sort of the crux of it is that germ theory, as it really took hold, and as people sort of looked up, I sort of imagine a married couple looking at each other over their morning coffee with the slow, cold realization that that's the person that probably gave you tuberculosis. <laughs> I always see it very cinematically in my mind. My thesis is that that moment in history catalyzed this sort of individualistic, neoliberal idea that we should just isolate ourselves and protect ourselves. That's the only way to survive these things that we don't know how to control called germs. And yet, what I identify in my chapters, and as you note, I do it disease by disease because I highlight the different specific social questions coming out of each disease. I identify these really beautiful moments in history where people are saying, no, I will look out for the greater good. I'm not just going to try to hermetically seal myself away in my house to preserve what I call bare biological life, a beating heart, but I'm going to help my community members engage in rich, fulfilling 
interpersonal relationships that are what make life worth living. Okay, but if if you're listening to this and the coronavirus epidemic is still ha- pandemic is still uh-huh. happening, don't do that, right? <laughs> Stay in your house. Well, no, no, no. Don't let listen me, to Professor Nixon either. right now. Either. This no, comes no, no. later. No, right I'm going to double down. I'm going to okay. double down. It's what I do. Here we go. So yes, we are isolating and staying in our home and social distancing, which I would actually love to talk a bit more about this because my first chapter goes way before the Victorian era and talks about Daniel Defoe writing about plague in 1722, way before germ theory. And he, my whole chapter is about how he promotes social distancing um, before I became apprised of that term with coronavirus. But no, I mean, of course I don't mean ignore public health mandates and that would never be the goal of medical humanities. The first thing I would say is of course my book is a a literary criticism book. So I am able to identify the ways that authors promote the communal good in the imaginative space of literature, right? Where people aren't actually dying from this. But secondly, I actually think that we have much greater opportunities to live this out real in reality than the Victorians did because we have social media. I mean, I'm sitting here right now having a really fulfilling, enriching conversation with you in spite of the fact that we can't leave our house. (laughs) And that never would have taken place had we not gotten in touch over social media. Exactly. All the toxicity that occurs in there. Yeah. And I mean, I've been seeing so many people saying, you know, people with um, people that are extreme extroverts, people with really high anxiety right now, people with substance abuse disorders that can't get to their AA meetings right now, reach out to me. I'm seeing that on Twitter. I'm seeing people develop group hangouts and FaceTimes and acknowledging what I, again, sort of as an academic, feel like I just kind of scream into the void of my office so often that these social relationships are why we're trying to keep staying alive. It's not just the functional existence of a beating heart. It's because we like other people. We're um, social and of animals. Course, Right. Yes. Yes. And you've seen the great videos coming out of Italy, I'm sure, that have gone viral. Ha ha pun yeah. absolutely intended. perfect yeah. and intended of the Italians singing together from their balconies and enjoying the communal space of song across a, a busy street in a balcony. So they're safe, but they're together. I mean, I just, I actually think we absolutely are doing these things because we're lucky enough to have this technology now. Another thing that I'm seeing is crowdsourcing of information because mm, I'm a member yes. of a, a bunch of physician communities and just the exchange of ideas globally and oh just floored by how smart people are like Mm -hmm. like you know yeah we don't have a vaccine for this we don't have a medical treatment for this but what worked in your icu what's been working for you have you tried this have you tried we tried this like just you know clearly not disclosing patient information but like just the back and forth and the exchange of ideas is uh, you know, across the globe. It, it's a testament, to, you know, to how social media just shows the rawness of how horrible we can be to each other yes. and how creative and wonderful we can be. Yes. I always say it's becoming more and more of my mantra as I think these things become, I think, as you say, more more raw and exposed in times of crisis, which again is why I think disease is this interesting space to study. I've been saying more and more humans are my least favorite and most favorite part of humanity. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I've been seeing it in my professorial communities because so many of us are now having to suddenly teach online. And just the way people have come together to make sure that we all are focused on the most ethical way to handle this with our students. I mean, initially I was thinking, we're talking on a Zoom meeting right now, you and I, I was like, well, great. Like, we'll just Zoom all our classes. It'll be fine. And I start seeing people posting and making Google Docs that are open access saying, you really can't assume that your students have internet reliably at home if they can't live in the dorms anymore. Um, For many of them, being on a college campus was a vital point of access to resources. Please don't do synchronous learning. You've got to do asynchronous learning where they can get on when they can. And I've just been so grateful that 
as much as I try to do my best as well, that we can crowdsource these things and think about things that we may not have thought of. Or for instance, I was home insecure as an undergrad. I didn't have reliable housing outside of my dorms. So my students that might have been displaced into an unsafe, non-existent or unhealthy home when the dorms closed, those at the forefront of my mind. And I emailed all the professors in my department and I said, what do we do? Like, we could probably offer students a place to stay, but I don't want to offer students that are currently taking my courses a place to stay because that gets kind of thorny when I'm still in grading authority. And we sort of developed this elaborate system by which we would house one another students to make sure that nobody was housing a student they were grading, but that all the students had housing turned out to be unnecessary because my university opted to keep limited dorms open because they were thinking about students' housing security. But um, like you, I've seen my communities come together. And I also say, you know, academics can, they can sometimes not be (laughs) the most pleasant people, but I've seen like the best and my most, my favorite sides of academia and why I became an academic coming out of this crisis. One of the questions that I had was going to lead to, can you please restore my faith in humanity with all of the horribleness that's about to ensue? And, and you did. So we will, we will now be able to skip that question. Thank you for restoring my faith in humanity. So during our first season, my first season of doing this podcast, I I had an episode called bad words. The title was longer than that. The, the, the idea is words, while we think that our ideas help us choose our words, and they do, words can shape our ideas. So that the interview was in the terms of patients with weight issues. Mm. But you say that our words can shape our ideas with regards to even a pandemic. So, and can ultimately influence the pandemic. So, Given that this is a largely physician audience, how can us, we as physicians utilize language that we use with our patients to convey the appropriate amount of gravity, mm. right? And help to help to shape that outbreak narrative that you talk about. Right. Well, um, I think what you're referring to is something that I started calling it this in my teaching, just kind of because it's what made sense to me and my students have found it really helpful. So I've I've kind of developed it further. Um, I believe it was in my CNN article and it's a huge part of my, my second book. Um, I call what you're discussing this um, dynamic, the socio-scientific discursive cycle, meaning that, of course, as you say, the way we talk about things can affect the way we frame scientific questions and inquiry. One really concrete way to think about that is it may frame the grant money that people ask for and what they're asking to study with certain grant monies. But that also, of course, the way we develop that science then filters into the way we speak generally. So the fact that uh, we just mentioned something, a meme going viral, of course, that comes out of the original notion of virology developed in uh, the 1940s or so. Yeah, so initially what I was focusing on with this pan well, before it was a pandemic or recognized as one, was really talking about origin points of viruses. That has been something, kind of a soapbox of mine, I suppose you would say, that when when we try to identify a patient zero, um, and this is where you'll have to let me know if if, if I've lost you, because people sometimes bristle at this idea. I'm not saying that epidemiology is incorrect when they identify a patient zero. But what a medical humanist in general would ask is when we frame the question that way to pinpoint a single source of an infection, what are we implying by that? And what are we looking for? And what might we be not thinking about when we ask that question? The answer to that, I would suggest, is, I mean, we we essentially are wanting someone to blame, I would think, right? Now, there may be broader scientific reasons why we just need to know an origin point, and I cannot speak to those, nor do I intend to, but I do think it's very, very stunningly human that we would like to figure out what started it all, and I think, therefore, that easily slides all too easily into blame. 
Uh, one of my favorite scholars ever from whom I learned everything I know about patient zero and healthy carriers and outbreak narratives, that's her term. Her name is Priscilla Wald. She's at Duke. And one thing I love about her book in her intro, it's called Contagious, Cultures, Carriers, and the Outbreak Narrative. She identifies the way that over and over and over again in history, we tend to say that diseases come from the East, we being, of course, Western culture. And what's great about the way she does this intro is she does not at all address whether she's saying the epidemiology is accurate or inaccurate. It's not a point of her art argument. That's not her field. She's a literature scholar like me. She simply presents it as the narrative that we've said about H1N1 and SARS and MERS. And she just lets the, that speak for itself so that you can't leave her book, in my opinion, as a reader without thinking, that's just a little too convenient for us over in America. And it makes you want to know more about if there might be some myopia in the way we've constructed these epidemiological questions that perhaps keep leading us to the same answer at the exclusion of other possible answers. I hope that didn't sound too much like I'm trying to debunk the entire field of epidemiology. I've, um, as I was editing my CNN piece over and over, I kept getting that criticism. And it's certainly not my or any medical humanist I know. Um, it's not our intention. No, the, the pattern is definitely there. Is it coincidence or is there actually something there? I'm, I'm certainly underqualified or completely unqualified to, to answer a question like that. But, but I would think identifying a patient zero, identifying where this came from, you know, it, we need things like that in order to find order in the chaos. Right. right. And, and just that's that's a hu very human need. It's a scientific need, right? Where did it come from can help us hopefully prevent another one, but it can also inform us as to what might help in terms of treatment. Now, I'm just I'm just guessing there. Do we need to know patient zero in order to to mm -hmm. or in order to accurately track the spread? Clearly that didn't help us here because it was being community spread before we realized it. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Those are definitely interesting concepts that bear some evaluation, right? Where, right. And why I think, does it I, always seem to come from the, quote, other? Right. I think, um, and something you said and the way you said that back to me made me, uh, it kind of clarified for me a better way to say it, that what we would say in the medical humanities is not that it's just necessarily wrong or or not wrong, but that if we as a society aren't seeing that there might be a potential bias there, if we're incapable of possibly identifying possible biases, then you're just absolutely certain to get some biases, right? So we're always just trying to get people to like think in different frameworks all the time to make sure that we do better science, to make sure that we're not missing something. Yeah, we're always bringing in our biases, we need to recognize that in order to account for it, in order to make sure we're being as objective as possible. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, I think I might have answered your question in a really circuitous way. Um, but xenophobia was on my mind, first of all, as, as the disease has developed, what I've been more concerned with is ableist language. Um, people saying, you know, well, it's only going to affect the infirm and the elderly. And there were great disability scholars coming out on, on Twitter and social media and saying, you know, that's unacceptable to phrase that as though the rest of, uh, you know, people without those conditions can stop worrying because that treats that population as disposable. Um, I, I feel like the medical community has done really great with this. I would not suspect generally that doctors would have been perpetuating any of those problematic stereotypes, but I do think that risk is really hard to convey accurately to patients who are almost certainly not medically as medically literate as their doctor, right? By definition. Well, and that also has been a problem in in our past, as you you mentioned in the that same CNN article, right? So syphilis was seen as a disease of sex workers, mm -hmm. not a, a disease of the husbands that were then taking it home <laughs> to their wives, who were then giving it to their children. You know their their unborn right. children, or HIV being a disease of homosexuals. So thinking that it was only 
affecting homosexuals while it was rapidly spreading in the heterosexual community as well. So by thinking it was a disease of the other, right, Mm -hmm. that helped it to continue spreading. And, And that's happening right now with the coronavirus, right? Like, I'm sure we all have seen pictures of millennials out at bars carousing and spreading the, I guess that shows that I'm not a millennial because I've <laughs> described them as carousing and potentially spreading the virus among themselves and then spreading it to others beyond that, right? So they're disregarding it because it's a disease that primarily affects the older population and those with comorbidities. Right, exactly. I mean, we've talked about seeing the the most beautiful parts of human nature and that would be the part that has disturbed me the most is that, again, that I identify in my book, that sort of individualism of, well, if I'm going to be okay, then who who cares about anything else? And the It's such an American concept. It is, it is. The older I get, maybe I'm showing my age here, but the older I get, the more I'm convinced that that's the root of all our problems in America. (laughs) But I think also the root of our solutions. Like, Mm. I can figure this out, whereas in America, you feel more empowered to be able to innovate, whereas other countries, if you're the member of a caste, I mean, we do really poorly with this in terms of socioeconomic status and race, right, Uh, where you might not feel as empowered as as you otherwise would be if you were a white male who Mm. feel like, as a white male, you know, (laughs) you feel a constant sense of empowerment. But but in America, like, you, you do have more social and mobility than in other places Mm. and more of an opportunity to innovate. And that's why we see all these, you know, innovation happening here, certainly happening other places in the world, but you know, America is definitely a, uh, a popular place where that, for that to take place. So the individualism is horrible um, (laughs) when you're being horrible to each other and ignoring other people's needs. But at the same time, you know, I have an idea. I think I can do this. Right. um, that American gumption, exactly. I think of it yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. And do attitude. No, but you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that's the sort of problematic attitude that, in fact, is allowing it. I mean, we see it epidemiologically. It's a fact that that is how it spread because people weren't worrying early enough about the most vulnerable among them. And yeah. unknowingly putting themselves at risk because... Right. Yeah. Some of the data that we've seen said there's the mortality from this is 0.2% in, I think it was like 10 to 40 year olds and, and 0.4% in 40 to 50 year olds. So right. 0.2% seems like it's not going to happen to you. But if you're, a, if you're in a high school of, oh man, am I going to do this math correctly? Uh-huh. Let's say 500 uh, people, right. Your high school class, then that means that I'm going to get this wrong. You know, one or two people are going to die of it. Doesn't mean yeah. they will, but you know the, that's where this is. So, so like right. two people that you know, like, and, and yet you're out and passing in much among each other, thinking that you are invincible. Right. And one of my students told me about coronavirus parties where people earlier on were using it for masks and stuff for costumes. And again, that speaks to this sort of privileged flippancy that it's not going to happen to you. And yeah, I think one of the ironies I tried to highlight in my CNN piece is that you get really rude awakenings when you behave that way. Um, One of the uh, texts that I discuss in my chapter on syphilis actually is uh, by Henrik Ibsen. It's a play called Ghosts. And it, it's literally about the, the way that his mother tried, uh, uh, the main character's mother tried to hide from the main character, the fact that he had syphilis. She tried to stay with this philandering husband to have this perfect seeming home, that that in fact delayed him getting this imaginary treatment uh, in the realm of the play and it causes his death due to syphilis. And he was writing that in direct response to exactly what you said, um, these sort of quote unquote good Victorian middle-class women who are giving birth to babies with the snuffles. You kind of only learn about this in medical school anymore because you don't typically see congenital syphilis these days, but the the snuffles and the notched teeth and all these but the very physical signs that a mother could see the second she held her baby just as easily as a doctor could that this was not what she had imagined. And it was striking visual evidence of the epidemiological fact that these were, as Ibsen called it, 
the ghosts of their behaviors and prejudices coming back to haunt them. And it's happening now. Well, history repeats itself. So yep. that's, why, that's why we need- <laughs> We wish it wouldn't. That's, it's why we need more historians out there. <laughs> I'm sure you've been shouting from the rooftops for a while from the very beginning here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mentioned the Kermit T thing. That's kind of how I keep thinking. You know, I taught a zombie class this January and we use that to talk about access to healthcare, ableism, cognitive alterities, so many different things. And one of the movies, of course, we watched was Contagion, even though that's not a zombie movie. As zombies have become sort of synonymous with contagious disease these days. And it's just been funny to watch people online now watching Contagion because now it seems relevant to them. And, and as I said in the beginning of this interview, for me, it's always... It's always been relevant. It's always been about to happen to us. <laughs> and now it just finally has. Your, your classes next semester are going to suddenly get a whole lot more popular. <laughs> I know. My poor kids in my zombie class thought it was all theoretical. and then I, Oh, and the CDC years ago played on the popularity of the zombie theme yeah. by having a, a, a page for what to do during the zombie apocalypse. But it was just a way for them to publicize disaster preparedness because yes, for any disaster a, there are a few things you're going to need and they just that was just the same list they had for every yeah, other disaster I yeah that's a required a, text in that class <laughs> a stroke of genius yep they have to read that and analyze it and kind of tell me what they think it means about our society so do you have any any parting words for the physician audience in the age of coronavirus what we should be looking for what should be prepared how we should be talking it about it, how we should be addressing it to, to patients or we, if we happen to have the media in front of us? <sighs> well, I mean, I think I would just circle back to sort of the theme of this whole interview that times like this give us the ability to really live our values, whatever those may be. And that applies to doctors, of course, too. Right now, I feel like doctors just by, you know, being on the front lines of this, even in private, you know, non-hospitalist practice are doing that. But I think just kind of realizing, uh, I teach my medical ethics students all the time. My, my sort of mantra, I hope I don't get in trouble for this. My mantra to these poor, these pre-med kids is Kaiser Permanente is coming for you. Um, <laughs> you, <laughs> you think that you want to help people. That's why you want to be a doctor and because you're smart and nobody's going to warn you until they throw you into the trenches that you're going to have a 15 minute appointment slot per patient. Seven of those minutes need to be writing up orders and notes. So you get eight minutes for a, a patient who is a human with a history and uh, needs and worries that are uniquely theirs. And I, I mostly spend my entire medical ethics class teaching my students about the lack of ethics in the pressures that are put on doctors today and just trying to give get their heads wrapped around that so they can prepare now for how to maintain their humanity and the good heart that got them into doctoring when those pressures arrive and i guess i would just say that this is a great time to try to if you can like be in the moment and just be the human talking to another human that is the reason you got into medicine. Because at the end of the day, nobody really knows perfectly what to do. And so I think more than anything, what will calm patients down is that human connection that so many people crave from their doctors. And I say all that background to say that I completely recognize the pressures that are on doctors to do that, to stop for a minute and say, okay, I'm a person. I'm talking to a worried person. Let's start from there. But I think, you know, in modern society, we all unfortunately are under those very frustrating economic productivity pressures. And it behooves all of us, even myself as well, to stop sometimes and just remind myself why I'm doing this to begin with. And as doctors, and, and for me too, as a disease scholar, um, this is that moment where I think we are called to do that as part of our calling. I don't think we can hear that enough. You know, we do we do hear that, but certainly 
we, we could hear it more. So I appreciate that. Professor Kari Nixon, author of Kept from All Contagion, Germ Theory, Disease, and the Dilemma of Human Contact. When is that available and where can we find it? Should be coming out in June. I have not been willing to ask yet if it's delayed because of the COVID um, issues. And it's coming out from SUNY Press. You can follow them on Twitter and they'll definitely be, they're promoting the book a lot lately because of its relevance. SUNY Press, I'm a SUNY graduate myself and you're oh, all wow. the way in Washington. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's awesome. SUNY Press. All right. Well, Professor Carr Nixon, thank you again. And hopefully we will get to do this again. Thank you so much. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.